Now, this slide alone is worth the price of admission for this month. And again, this is a huge topic, maybe a whole day topic in and of itself. But take a look at this. Once I'm all done, maybe come back to this slide and really kind of think about all of these different influences. And, you know, look, influences on hamstring health, sure, but influences on just about any muscle group or any joint. These are all things that can influence the health of our body. So just kind of going through these briefly. When we think about position, this guy in particular makes him super, super fast. He's if you're talking PRI, he's a PEC. If you're not talking PRI, he's got a bilateral anterior pelvic tilt. He's a very extended individual, and he really struggles to keep his hips and his pelvis underneath him. Well, what does that do to your hamstrings? It makes them very long. So they're constantly long. They're constantly stretched out. And when Bill evaled him, he actually checked his hamstring range of motion. I mean, this guy was at like 90 to 110 degrees on his left hamstring, and there was just no tone no catch, right? So your body should be protecting yourself at that point. And he had stretched so much, he'd lost some of that. So our goal was to give him tone back, to reposition his pelvis, to get his hips back underneath him, and to shift his center of gravity back a little bit. Because it's definitely this, this double-edged sword, right? Like you want to be extended to a degree so you can be fast, but you've got to be able to control that extension so that you don't get injured. And in this guy's case, so you can change levels. So you can break down, you can decelerate, get in and out of a cut quickly. So position is huge. Second, you've got fatigue. So you're going to see when I flesh this program out, we're doing things to try and stave off fatigue, to develop his energy systems, because we could do all the right things, right? We could do all this other stuff, work on position, coordination, mechanics, you know, the training load, in, increase his ability to withstand or accept forces. But ultimately, if he can only do that for a quarter or a half of a game, then that's going to, you know, put him in a position where he could re-injure himself. So we had to rebuild his energy systems because ultimately he's got to be able to hold position. He's got to be able to demonstrate force output and force reduction over the course of an entire game. Force is the one that everybody loves to talk about, and this is why everybody is just obsessed with Nord boards and all these, you know, like knee flexion focused exercises. Really, ultimately, what they're training is the ability to control knee extension, right? Because that's when most guys get injured. It's, you know, that violent whipping of the shank or the lower leg. It comes out, they don't have the eccentric control via the hamstrings at the knee joint, and that's when the hamstrings get strained. So force, yes, absolutely, but I'm not just looking at knee flexion. I'm looking at their ability to control hip flexion as well, so thinking the top part of the hamstrings, and then ultimately getting them back to sport-specific movements, and I can't stress this highly enough. It makes me cringe when I see a return-to-play protocol that is solely focused on weight room work. We have to prepare our athletes for the forces, the contractions that they're going to see in live chaotic environments in a game. So ultimately, if they're going to sprint and if they always pull their hamstring sprinting, well, I need to get them to sprint. I need to do it the right way, but ultimately they have to sprint. I have to increase their ability to withstand that stress because if I don't do those things, ultimately I've done them a disservice. Training load is a big one, um, and that's really managed by the coaching staff and the sports science staff. Some cool stuff here. I'm going to talk about this more at the uh, Physical Preparation Summit, but if you do not manage training loads correctly, you leave your athletes exposed to injury, and I'll just leave it at that. We have mechanics, so how they run, how they lift, all of those things. This is another big one. Um, this guy in particular has a tendency to overstride, and he would not only overstride with regards to his lower leg getting out in front of his center of mass, which really puts the hamstrings in a bad position, but he would also overstride when, say, he was accelerating. So his knees would come up excessively, which would put a lot of stress on the top of the hamstring. And then just coordination. You know, can you turn the right muscles on and off when you need them? So very brief synopsis. 
but I would implore you guys, go back, really think about this, and think about an athlete that you've dealt with, and maybe they have this constant injury that they can't seem to figure out. Look at all of these factors, and I guarantee you're going to have more insights as to why that athlete gets injured.